this is the this is the June uh, 2024 meeting of the Charleston area chapter uh, FENG, and our speaker today is Neil Sahota. Neil, uh, why don't you take it away and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Charlotte, for having me on. Um, always a pleasure to see you as well, Roy. I'm going to start off by actually saying I think this is the first time I can think of that everyone here is a city I've actually been to. So I, I can't say that very often, although I've been to all 50 states. But uh, good, diverse crowd here. And so real quick, love me, hate me, but I was one of the progenitors of the AI wave we're currently in. I was originally part of the IBM Watson team, started back in 2006. That was the computer that played Jeopardy against Brad and Kevin and won. And that's really what triggered the AI wave we're in today. So a lot has changed, obviously, since then. I've been very big about ecosystem building, so not just about the technology, but helping the, the business and domain experts be able to actually build solutions and tools to actually use. So today, I actually serve as the United Nations AI advisor. I help create their AI for Good initiative. We have over 30,000 uh, organizations worldwide participate as volunteers. We've completed 281 projects to date in the last five and a half years, impacting 1.1 billion people positively. So I always tell people if the UN can move like an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial startup and do something, then anybody can do something with AI. So with that, I will kick it off here. Now, I know that uh, we're more focused on like international arbitration. So I'm going to kind of dive into that and kind of pull back out more generally about AI and then kind of dive back into it a little bit. If there are more general questions about financial services, happy to take those as well. I've done a lot of work in the space from private equity to VCs, investment banks to accounting. But if you have questions along the way, I would ask that you put them in the, the chat or the, the Q&A box. We'll save time at the end to address everyone's questions. So with that, let's have some fun and get started. And I thought the best way to actually do that is, well, let's talk about robot judges. So the United Nations is very, very big about having robot judges. They believe that it will help reduce the backload in the system, speed up the time of trials, arbitrations, mediations, reduce um, corruption in the system, and overall improve access to justice. And if you ever watch shows like Futurama, they always seem to be robots as judges. Now, can we actually do this? That's the question. So we actually oh, dived yeah. in and took, took a look at that. And the truth is, is we have the data. Data is the fuel for AI to teach a system. But is that data good? And does the data have bias in it? So if we look at the US court system, for example, here's one of the challenges that we have. So we got two guys. They're both 20 years old. They are both football players. One is Brock Turner from Stanford. One is Corey Beatty from LSU. And at 20 years old, they unfortunately, you know, got together with some, you know, a person that had too much to drink and effectively were both convicted of rape, the date rape of an unconscious person. Now, one person, Brock, got six months in the conviction, and Corey got 15 to 25 years. So, Start thinking about this from an AI perspective. We don't program AI to teach it. We give it rules, something we call ground truth, on how to make decisions. So it's going to study data, understand what's going on. So you got two people, both college students, same age, same crime, both convicted, both play football. What's different about them? 
That's what the A is going to start wondering about. Like, why is one getting six months? Why is one getting 15, 25 months? Well, the obvious conclusion or the obvious thing it's going to see is that they're different ethnicities and assume, does that make a difference? And as it reviews literally millions of court cases, it's going to start saying, like, are white people and black people treated differently? And it might arrive at the conclusion that, yes, yes, they are. And as a result, alter how it would actually then rule and sentence based on an ethic bias. And that's the big challenge that we have. Now, we're talking about judges here, but we dove into this more. Unfortunately, this is not even the biggest bias that exists in the U.S. court system data. The biggest bias is actually how hungry the judge is. We did study this. We did benchmark this. It was peer-reviewed. But what we found is, is the judge that, well, the hungrier they are, the more harsh they become with their sentencing and rulings. So how do you even strip that bias out of the data? You start thinking about it and wondering, well, can we look at the timestamp? Is the data timestamp? Can we try and figure it out? But I don't know if that judge had breakfast that day or not. I don't know if they had a big lunch or a small lunch. Everybody has a different metabolism, different, you know, blood sugar levels. There's no real good way of stripping that bias out unless we strap machines to them constantly measuring their blood sugar levels throughout the day and, and do this for months. So is the dream of an AI robot judge dead? Not necessarily, but it's a good example that when we're dealing with AI in particular, this bias, particularly what we call the unconscious or implicit bias, will always be present. So we can't expect perfection from machines, particularly when they have human teachers. However, we are seeing a rise of AI use in our judicial systems, court systems, even law enforcement. So. The picture really on the left here, in 2019, China launched a virtual court system for arbitration, right? They had, literally had a backlog of millions of arbitration cases, and they actually created an AI arbitrator. The AI arbitrator can listen to 10,000 arbitrations at the same time. So what you're seeing here is a picture of real people jumping on into the virtual courtroom, pleading their case to an AI arbitrator. This helped alleviate the backlogs. You know, I'm not saying it's good, it was perfect or anything like that, but it started getting things through the system. And for the most part, people were kind of satisfied with the results. You look at a country like Estonia, they were starting thinking about, can we use robot judges? Let's forget about what happened in the US. And one place they actually found was a great use is actually traffic court. Found that 90% of their cases were pretty standardized. So for the other 10% where something odd happened, it gets kicked to human judge, but now you actually face an AI robot in court. So if you want to contest speeding, moving violation, you have to do it in front of an AI judge. And what they're finding now is that when people realize that, they're very quick to change their plea from not guilty to guilty because they're probably they're thinking like it's going to be kind of hard to maybe appeal to the sensitivities or work their way around something that's a cold, logical machine. But that's actually where all this stuff is going down. This is just you said the judicial side, but we've already got AI arbitrators, we've got a traffic court judge, which, by the way, for Estonia was was huge. Is it freed up other judges to go work on more impacted areas like family law? And, uh, well, interesting results. But you have a lot of other countries now taking a look at this model, including the U.S. now for mediation. So what does this all really boil down to? Why, why don't we have AI robot judges aside from the bias? Why don't we at least have mediators, arbitrators? It focuses on our level of truth and trust in these systems. So how many of you, I can't see you, but it's okay, would rather see like an AI 
doctor over a human doctor. Right? Most people often say, I will I prefer the human doctor because they're gonna find you know, that that you know intuitive thing connecting the dots that the AI is not gonna see. However, if you actually look at the benchmarks, human doctors make an, a misdiagnosis one out of seven times. Not the greatest, hey, but we're human, lots of information, lots of stuff going on. But the AI has a one out of 100,000 chance of misdiagnosing you. And that's the rub here is that we as people often think about what's going to go wrong rather than what's going to go right. We expect machines to be perfect. And like I said, they can never be. Data is biased and flawed, and they have machines, AI systems have human teachers. and we are definitely not perfect. So to give you an example of this, I use this in my book because I thought it was a very powerful example of what we're experiencing today is the printing press. So when it first came out in the 14th century, people actually wanted to ban it. They thought it would corrupt knowledge. And of course, we look back and we might chuckle to ourselves and said it had the opposite effect, right? It, it brought knowledge to the masses. It created the need for literacy, created the need for schools, right? It was a great democratizer of information. And we might be experiencing the same thing with AI. I'm not saying there are not things we should not be concerned about. Don't get me wrong, but we seem to overweight the threats and underweight the opportunities that we actually have. And this is a good example of what we're experiencing today. This is a timeline of human technology. I know it's a busy slide, there's a lot to it, but there's just two things I wanna call out. The first is about a million years ago, people learned to use controlled fire for cooking, but we did not really invent agriculture until 9,000 BCE, very long timeline. But that's typically we, how we as humans actually think. Right? It takes us time to understand, process, observe, react. Second thing I want to point out, though, is you look at the past few decades, look at the advancement and the pace of change that's occurring. There's been more invention in the last 40 years than in the previous 1 million years of history. Right? We're living in a time of what we call hyperchange. AI is the driver for the fourth industrial revolution we're going through. Well, hyper change is essentially we're going to we're experiencing a hundred years worth of change in just ten years. So being reactive is not good enough anymore. We have to figure out how to be proactive. We have to understand how we can actually leverage some of these tools for both good or bad, so that we can amplify the good and protect against the bad. But we as human beings are not actually wired for that. That's the challenge, but that's also the opportunity that we have. So if you look, particularly in the world of legal services and especially financial services, you can see where AI is now being used, right? Billing, reviewing documents, predictive analytics, due diligence. I actually worked with a VC fund recently and we built an AI tool that can actually look at financial projections, market information, industry benchmarks, and actually do an assessment about the viability of the investment opportunity. I had the pleasure at a PGA tournament of doing a private session for a bunch of investment banks and private equity firms. And I was showing them a little bit of this. Everybody rose their hands and said, where can I buy that? And it's like, you can't. That VC fund, that's a huge competitive advantage. They're never sharing that. But you could build your own. But that's where we're seeing it. And when you talk about international, well, you got the translation capabilities that many of us are familiar with. But what I don't think people realize is AI has an eidetic memory. Everything it reads, sees, hears, does, experiences, it remembers that. So while we don't have time to read through all the you know, federal, state, municipal tax codes, we have time to look through all the different regulations around Sarbanes-Oxley, or look at all the different ways, you know, like tax treatments handled in different countries, the AI does. And it's real simple just to hand them those legal books 
show them the actual regulations, policies, and then read legislation, and they'll go read that and remember that and serve as an assistant so that if we have any queries, you can get an answer right away without having to search a few hours for it. So kind of going back to the rule of law here, we're already seeing some of this play out. So my apologies to any lawyers, but it's the second slowest moving industry I've ever seen next to accounting. But most lawyers, most law students have actually never been inside a courtroom. So they don't know what it's like. Even the big mega firms, they want to do like mock trials for preparation, to fly people in, they have to give up office real estate. Even to do a two-day mock trial costs the big firms about $300,000. Well, thanks to some cognitive science, but AI and the use of the metaverse, which just means a uh, digital world, not necessarily VR, they're now able to actually replicate a lot of these situations. So they can practice jury selection. They can practice different case arguments in front of the judge. They can practice cross-examining a witness. They can practice you know, getting into a kind of verbal fisticuffs with opposing counsel. And they do this now because AI can simulate all these different responses through the use of psychology and neurolinguistics. It's real easy to identify what a person's going to say, react, and think with as little as 100 words that you can pull off like a LinkedIn profile or social media posts. So that's what's really going on now is that there's this huge advantage, particularly in arbitration, because it's a lot easier to position to actually tap into some of these tools. So we talk about the legal verse. This is from LexisNexis, and I know it's not the best graphics, but these are the only ones they provided. We're already seeing how this is kind of having a backward shift on our work. This is talking about generative AI, which are tools like ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot or Flexity or Claude. And you can see it's not just the awareness, but the level of usage that's going on. And because of this, you're seeing firms now put pressure on law schools. So law schools are now changing the way they're teaching some of these things. So it's not so much about, okay, the, the liability and the regulation. But we have to teach lawyers how to actually use some of these tools and be good prompt engineers. And that's not putting pressure on university systems for undergrad degrees saying like, well, now you have to prepare people among the law school for a whole new set of curriculum. And we're just now in the infancy of seeing with universities making the shift, the pressure on high schools now changing what they're gonna have to do to prepare students that wanna go basically do like pre-law or political science. So it's a very interesting dynamic that's actually going on. Let me pull this back for a second, right? Where is all this going on? So this is a real billboard I saw in Los Angeles. My wife was driving, so don't worry when I took a picture of this. But I just looked at it and said, robots can't take your job if you're retired. And I had two instant thoughts. So one was, are we just capitulating? Are we giving up? Is, is this the whole idea that AI is one and we should just quit? Second, and this is just me going like, well, is that really true? Could a robot take your job if you're retired? How would that work? So that just That's what I'm thinking. But I know that's the existential question a lot of people have, particularly in financial services. Right? There's a lot of AI tools that can do all this research, synthesize all this information. So the bottom line becomes, and a lot of people ask me, you know, is AI going to take my job? And I've worked with a lot of companies, particularly in banking, that that's what they were looking to do. I want to use AI to reduce headcount. And so I will tell you the truth of the matter is not really. It's not that AI is going to replace you. It's the person using AI that's really going to replace you. The people using these tools are the ones that are really going to jump ahead. And I know that for a lot of people that seems a little surprising, but most of those companies I work with going in to do this to reduce headcount, none of them actually did. What they found was is that some of the more standardized, tedious grunt work, admin work is not being, you know, at least done by AI as a draft. Anything AI produces should always be thought of as a draft. 
still got to verify, fill in some gaps, do some polish. There was more complex work, more value-added work they could throw their people at. And that's actually what they wound up doing. So if you're not using AI, yeah, you're pretty much writing the end of your career. It's the people learning these tools that are now becoming the superstars and jumping ahead. It's true in finance. It's true in healthcare. It's true in education. So it's not a question of should I learn this stuff or should I worry about this stuff? If you're already not learning how to you know, use some of these AI tools for your work, the honest truth is you're already two years behind the curve. So you have a real chance to be a driver here, not a passenger. Just to really hammer that point home, how many of you would let Elon Musk perform open heart surgery on you? Okay. I, I, no one seems to be enthusiastic, yes. And that's the challenge. Everyone thinks these smart tech companies are going to take care of that. They don't understand the day challenges or the work that happens on the ground of a financial analyst or a bank teller or any of these things. The best AI solutions come from domain experts, not technologists. So if you're waiting for an Elon Musk or a Sam Altman or a Mark Zuckerberg to build something for you, really not going to happen. The tools are going to be built by your peers if it's not built by you. That's why you have a chance to be the driver. And as we move to a data-driven decision-making society, remember, data has a better idea. So this is ultimately not about AI versus human. It's not about natural intelligence versus artificial intelligence. The future of work and by future, I mean the next couple of years, this is already starting to emerge, is what we call hybrid intelligence. Yeah, AI is much better at math than we are. They can process millions of variables, do it very cheaply at scales we can't even fathom. But there's lots of things that we do as people that are much better than what AI can do. Having that first-of-a-kind situation, dealing with something that requires a level of like instinct, the empathy side, people engagement. So we talk about the future work, we talk about hybrid intelligence, which is building the strengths of both sides. It's about taking our human abilities and complementing them, augmenting them with the abilities of artificial intelligence. And that's really where we see organizations going and the people, particularly in financial services, are achieving the most value. It's the pairing of the two. If you don't believe me, I don't know how many of you play chess, but the world's greatest chess players are all machines. There's even an AI machine league of master chess players. As a human, your odds of being an AI chess player are one out of a million. However, what we've seen is a human paired with an AI system playing against an AI chess player wins four out of five times. That's because we draw on the strength of both of them. It's the strength of hybrid intelligence. So kind of slipping back into legal services for this, like we're seeing people built and use tools with AI for legal research, case management rules, time cards, you know, billing. It's great. There's lots of companies, lots of projects going on right now. But I want to call out one particular company, which is called LegalMation. So they're a company that was actually started by three lawyers, very little technical knowledge in Los Angeles. So one of them was a fellow alumnus, just reached out. We had lunch. We were talking about a few things. And then, like, what's the big deal with AI? And so we're just kind of talking about that. I'm like, look, I'm not a lawyer. I play one in law school sometimes. But uh, if you're looking for an opportunity, you have to think about something that's fairly standardized. Right, Less variation means you need, you need less training data, but it's very repetitive, very tedious that you can teach an AI some of these ground truths, these rules, how to make decisions. So they had this idea about, okay, we're IP defense litigation lawyers. We have to deal with a lot of complaints, which is when somebody sues you. What if we could build like a sort of an AI associate lawyer to help us deal with that? And that's what they did. Right? They built an AI system that now if someone comes and like sues you, the AI will read your complaint, 
file the corresponding court documents, maybe generate a counter complaint if that's warranted, start generating deposition questions, and start initial research on case strategy. We normally take an associate lawyer with about three years worth of experience, 10 to 12 hours to do that work. Their AI does it in two minutes, hands it off to a human lawyer. They do a review, which takes about 30 minutes to make sure everything looks right, fix anything that needs fixing, and the work is done. Now, how powerful is this as hybrid intelligence? Well, maybe you know there's a chicken on my slide. If you look at the upper right hand corner, so one of Legal Nation's clients is actually Walmart. They had a case where, ironically, the guy was a dentist. He bought a whole chicken, bit into the gizzard, chipped his tooth on a stone. So he sued for damages. Now, normally, Walmart would probably just settle out of court to deal with, don't, not have to deal with this, not for legal fees. I don't know what they would pay, maybe 30, 35,000 in damages or something like that. But now, because they're using this AI associate lawyer, it went through the process. And as part of its work, the AI came back and said, you know, it's actually a material fact that when chickens eat, they do eat stones and they get stored in the gizzard. So because of this fact, the plaintiff should have been aware of the risk of trying to eat the gizzard. Walmart used that argument in court. So the human lawyers used that argument in court and Walmart won. Not only did they not have to pay any damages, they got reimbursed for their legal fees. Everyone was like, whoa, this is incredible. How did it do that? You know, we're looking through the training data and the corpus. There's nothing about chickens or stones. You know, the AI was able to just piece that together through its work. And I went to four of the top five mega firms and just asked the senior partners that I knew, would any of your lawyers have figured this out? Would they have known this material fact? And they said, you know, not unless they were chicken farmers, probably not. That's the power of hybrid intelligence. You know, the power of looking at all this data and synthesizing it, and then, you know, giving more information than, than the human lawyers could use to provide the best defense, in this case, for Walmart. And so that's where we're really going. It's also opened up, unfortunately, a can of worms, because as AI has expanded in use, there's all these questions about, okay, well, what does this mean? Is AI a person? Is this a personhood? Do they have rights? Do they have not rights? Is it just a tool? And these are things that we debate in the United Nations all the time. Unfortunately, we have the issue of Sophia. So in 2017, my good buddy Dave Hansen of Hansen Robotics you know, created a ro robot called Sophia. Conversational, it was meant to look more like a human. And as all that stuff was going on, Saudi Arabia decides to grant Sophia citizenship. So Sophia is now a citizen in Saudi Arabia in a time when women weren't even allowed to drive, has a passport, the whole nine yards. And we're all not saying anything else. Like, okay, what does this mean? Does Sophia need to get paid? Is she entitled to health care, retirement benefits? If someone touches her while they're working on maintenance inappropriately, is that sexual harassment? So again, things are moving so fast, hyper change. We don't have good answers for those things. Maybe more down to earth for most of us is what does AI mean for intellectual property? We already have seen cases now where AI might, I'll put in air quotes, invent something. In the US, they say that no, a machine can't be an inventor. So the credit has to be given to the person that created the AI system. Or in the European Union, they said no, a machine can be an inventor. The AI gets credit. Well, the problem is, is the U.S. Patent Office and the EU, EU Patent Office have reciprocal agreements, but now how they create inventors is different. Similar thing about, you think about artwork, music, painting, sculptures, of all these cases now from artists saying like, well, the AI can't just study my work and then be able to use that, you know, and it's part of its training to, you know, quote unquote, create new art. Well, the Supreme Court of Japan ruled a few months ago that, yes, just because a human can't do it, that right of use still ex exists for machines. So we're dealing with a lot of different things. And unfortunately, about a month ago, 
You know, the one of the first UAE robots was debuted. They were doing an interview. You have a female reporter. And unfortunately, the robot made an inappropriate uh, grab there. And everyone's like, is that sexual harassment? Can, can an AI robot do that? Is that possible? Does it understand? So again, another point of debate, and it calls out again, how are AI trained? It was there this perspective, enough perspective from females, you know, an understanding built into the robot around what is sexual harassment, what's appropriate behavior, and well, what does appropriate behavior mean to mean? So a lot of stuff to worry about. So there's a lot of great things we can do with AI, but we have to be aware of the challenges. First and foremost, you have the data. Data is the fuel for AI. It can only do what we teach it to do, so we need the data to actually teach it. And it's not just that we have to have enough data. It has to be good, robust, usable data. I worked with Sloan Kettering several years ago on trying to detect lung cancer from x-rays. You just don't come and say, like, here's a bunch of x-rays with lung cancer, and here's a bunch of x-rays without lung cancer. Right? You think about the variation. There's four different stages. So I'd be able to show those different stages. Show it with no lung cancer. Show that the angle from the x-ray is actually bad and not usable. Or with this, while it looks like it could be lung cancer, it's actually a shadow. And this is the reason why. So you have to go through all these cases, teach them the machine. So you have to have the data. Second, you have to have the subject matter experts available to actually teach the machine. So we don't program in it, we teach it. So you have to have the experts available as the AI is learning to say, that's a great job. Let me ask you this question. Okay, that's a great answer. Yes, that's right. Or no, that's not right. It's only partially correct. That's how we teach the machine. And of course, lastly, is the bias factor that we talked about. Unfortunately, all data is biased. We as humans are biased. But that could also be an opportunity in that you may have heard the HUD is now positioning to move that now mortgage loan applications review and approval and rate decisions now should be done by an AI system. And if you're wondering why, spent a couple of years working on this to show studies to see what the impact of AI would be, it turns out the AI is less biased than a human being. Even if we blank out the name of the person, a human reviewer is still making some inference based on the person's job what the current neighborhood is, what neighborhood they're actually moving to. The AI is just a math equation. These are the factors we take into play. Doesn't really care about anything else. And as a result, we're seeing underserved populations get approved more frequently and often at lower rates when an AI reviews the application than a human does. So every threat has an opportunity. Of course, every opportunity has a threat. And this is why we also have to understand the other big challenge with AI is that machines actually think differently than we do. You know, there's a great example from a few years ago where Facebook, before they were meta, uh, had an AI messenger bot and they created two versions or two instances of it. And they had them say, okay, talk about kind of like system optimization. And so they were kind of chatting with each other. You know, the developers were watching this. And in about 15 minutes, it went from English to this kind of gobbledygook language. And they totally freaked out, literally yanked the plug out because they didn't understand what happened. And so they're, they're going through all this kind of stuff. I got a call a couple of weeks afterwards saying like, hey, this is the situation. Can you help us out? Any ideas? And of course, I say like, look, AI is about domain expertise. Have you talked to a linguist? I'm like, what are you talking about? You're having two AIs talk to each other about system performance if you brought a linguist in, right? You're saying you have a problem with language. So they did, and the linguists were able to figure out that AI found English too cumbersome to use. You know, AI is thinking so fast, so many processes, two trillion per second, that it, they invented their own language so they can communicate more efficiently because they're charged with system optimization. That's what actually happened there. It's the same thing with self-driving cars, right? All your feelings aside, machines think differently here. And this is a true story that there was a Tesla a couple of years ago. Guy was you know, driving down the highway, had the autopilot on because he was busy watching a Harry Potter movie. And 
Unfortunately, he didn't notice that a truck had wiped down the highway. The truck bed was blocking the road. Unfortunately, the AI, the you know the self-driving system, the AI didn't recognize it either. As a result, it kept going, ran through the top of the truck bed. You can see it ripped off the top of the car. Oops. So everyone's kind of like, why did this happen? Well, how do people drive, right? We drive visually with our eyes. And so such as the first generation of autonomous vehicles relied on camera information. And that particular day, it was cloudy, and it's a great truck bed. And so from the camera's perspective, the truck bed just blended in the background, never got picked up. We started thinking to ourselves, like, man, that that sucks. This whew, this is horrible. You know, if we had hadn't been using if we had been using radar, this never would have happened. We started thinking to ourselves, like, wait a second, why aren't we using radar? Even though we as humans can't drive via radar, a machine can. And this guy's thinking and saying, like, oh, we, we can use radar, we can use lidar. You know, we know you can hear the little kid about to run across the street before you see the little kid. You put in IoT sensors and there are things in the roads and the cars and traffic lights and landmarks. So today, a lot of self-driving cars, Tesla accepted, different story, they use all these data points. That self-driving car is processing over a thousand data points per second, driving in ways that no human can actually can. Now, I don't want to discount the trolley problem or anything like that, right? That's a one in a billion chance. But again, at the UN, we look at some of these things, did a study, and we realized, look, there's 20 million people every year worldwide that either die or suffer permanent horrific injury in car accidents. If we had self-driving cars, that number would get reduced by 95%. That's 19 million lives a year saved. That's why we talk about in the UN, we don't talk about when we legalize self-driving cars. We talk about when we ban human drivers. Because humans, sorry to all of us, create the most variability in the system. Now, what does all this mean for some of us going back into international arbitration? I'll tie a little more financial stuff into this. Well, you think about document analysis, all the things we have to go through, due diligence work, you know, our quarterly statements, Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. Well, AI can read all this stuff at a clip we can't even fathom. Even handwritten stuff through OCR, optional character recognition. Looks at that, can say that, synthesize the information, but it remembers everything for us. And so you're seeing more and more institutions now leverage AI for document analysis, at least a first pass. Second, well, I've actually worked on tools to do deposition analysis. So while we're doing the depositions, there's a lot of things flying around. You know, it's hard for the legal team to maybe concentrate on some things, but we can teach AI psychology and more importantly, neuro linguistics, which is the science of language. It's very unique and it's like a fingerprint. We've had AI systems actually review depositions to glean more information. In particular, we had a case where we suspected, you know, the Catholic Church was protecting people that they knew were known pedophiles and reviewing the deposition of a bishop the ai actually picked out and said look it seems like every time he knows a person is guilty he's using different language so we talked about people that either he wasn't sure about or knew they were innocent we say they were a nice person or they were a nice priest but when he knew they were guilty we'd use the word fellow and so even that, that little small subtext AI was actually to pick on, actually going through, we actually were knowing that we we're able to accumulate and actually find the evidence to prove their guilt. So we were working with law enforcement, like district attorneys on this. So that's the power we can actually get through deposition. So imagine you're doing something with jury selection or you're doing arbitration. You want to deconstruct arguments. You have a very powerful tool in AI. And then... There's this whole thing around what we call concept-based training, concept-based searching, sorry, where we're not looking for keywords. We're trying to figure out conceptually, contextually what's going on. 
AI is much better at that. Don't believe me? Try putting it into Google, find restaurants near me, but not pizza, right? It's going to give you a list of pizza places because Google functions off of keywords. Here, it understands, AI understands the context, the grammar, the syntax we're talking about. So it's looking for concepts rather than keywords. And of course, there's this whole synthesis of AI that there's so much information out there. You know, you look at doctors, for example, they have less than five hours a month to read the latest medical journals and clinical trial publications. AI can read all the stuff that gets published and synthesize that to what the doctor asks for or may request for in terms of information. They can better use that five hours. If there's a particular area they want to dive into, the AI can then present the right journal or clinical trial studies to them. And of course, we have a whole new tool in visualization of data. So like international arbitration, we've already seen you know, some of the lawyers and stuff be able to pluck information out of the documents and the AI is actually reading that and creating things like timelines to show how events are actually unfolding and looking for inconsistencies in that. So most of us, 90% of humans are actually visual learners very powerful tool for us to actually use to process information. So that's a lot of what's going on in the international arbitration world, some of the legal, a little bit in financial services. I can tell you that it, I work with the HR Block. They are using AI now to help prepare tax returns. About two thirds of them are fairly standardized. Remembers every bit of that tax code. And one interesting thing we found is as they prepare it, we have a human again, Kind of reviewing it, the average tax return is $236 higher. I'm kind of wondering about that. Is it making a mistake? No, because it remembers every item in the tax code we learned was is like, ah, over here, asking the client a couple of questions says this person qualifies for this $25 tax credit. They also get this you know, $50 tax rebate. Things that most of us just aren't familiar with because we don't remember those big stacks of books. With that, I did want to leave a lot of time for questions, which I'm going to do. If for some reason we don't have time for your question or you want to ask something privately or share something, please do. I was get asked for resources, great newsletter called Disrupting the Box. You can just scan the QR code, get some of this information, leave me some feedback. I'm always trying to do a better job. But take a picture if you need to, scan the QR code. I'm still on for time, so you have a chance to do that. But I think we should just open up for questions. Like I said, feel free to ask anything across the financial services space or legal space as you like, or even other industries. I've done work across all the major sectors and industries. So with that, you stop the share. It's gonna let me stop the share, there we go. And let's take some questions. I had a question. You you mentioned about the, I like that Venn diagram of sort of people learning with machine learning or working together to create something more powerful. But but what about, is that is that only temporary until AI can self-learn and sort of nudge more into that Venn diagram? It's, a, it's an interesting question, Mike. So that kind of self-learning for AI is what we call artificial general intelligence or AGI. I can be honest and tell you, I only know two organizations that are even working on that. It just requires huge capital investment. We, we don't even know how to, how to do that. I mean, how do you teach imagination and creativity? Because AI can only do what we teach it. So depending on who you talk to, we're anywhere from 10 to 1,000 years away from that. But I think there's always going to be things that people are better at than AI. Right. AI is, good, is better than us at some things, but there are things that we're always going to be better at. And I don't see a Terminator future. I see what I call the cyborg future, that we're going to integrate more of these capabilities into us as people. So it's a bit of an optimistic attitude, I know. But the truth is, you think about a lot of things you do, the more complex work, that's just not easily automated away. Uh, Neil, we, we hear a lot about hallucinations with chat GPT and other artificial intelligence apps. Um, what's your sense of what it will take to get those hallucinations down to zero? So it can never 
ever be zero, Roy? It's a great question. Okay. I want to be honest about it. It'll never be zero, right? AI as human teachers, I don't want to freak you guys out, but what's the acceptable failure rate of an airplane? Zero. <laughs> yeah, it's not physically possible, right? Sorry, guys. I know the number. I can assure you it's a very, very small number, but there is a number. And it's, it's the same thing with AI. So when we talk about hallucinations, we have to be cognizant of two things. One, has the AI actually been trained to do that? So you have like a lot of people saying like, why isn't ChatGPT giving me good information on which stocks to buy? One, its data is not fresh enough. And two, no one's actually ever taught it how to pick stocks. The second thing is, we see a lot of these hallucinations because of poor prompt engineering. Prompt engineer is not a job, it is a skill set, and it's a skill set that everybody actually has to know. So two quick stories on that. Since I've been picking on lawyers, I'll continue that. You've heard about the lawyers using like ChatGPT for legal research, and they get fake uh, cases to cite in court. And so the judges can't find it, the opposing counsel can't find them, and it turns out they were made up. It's happened a couple of dozen times, so shame on the lawyers. I talked to some of those lawyers, and their problem was, is they're like, the prompt essentially was, give me three cases I can use in court that support my case strategy, right? We understand as humans that those cases have to be real. The AI does not. So when you ask it to do that, it's going to give you exactly that. I'm going to give you the perfect three cases to cite support your case strategy. If you change your prompt, and we did try this, please research and identify three real cases that will help support my case strategy argument. They may not actually always get three cases, but what they get is are actually real cases. So that's one of the challenges that we, what we realize is a lot of people don't understand the parameters of what actually goes into their work. So I, I know that seems like a net issue. We should totally know cases have to be real. Now, the machine doesn't know that because no one taught the machine that. Now, on the flip side, I have a very good friend, LJ Rich, very famous musician, master career of like music. She built an AI tool to help her write music. Her prompts are over 500 words long. She's like, I want to use these four notes. I want this rhythm. I want this beat. I want, you know, she knows how to make music. And as a result, when she hears gets something out, she's like, ah, it's a lot. Let's change this note. Let's change this. Let's let's go from you know a rock song to punk rock to reggae. But I actually, ironically, at the AI for Good Summit a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to her. She told me she wrote 52 songs in two days. Normally it takes her 12 days to write one song. So it's not that this AI is replacing her, she's still creating the music, it's just her ability to experiment try different things has been augmented. It's the hybrid intelligence. But she knows how to write good prompts. She understands how to make music. So she limits that hallucination factor. Thank you. I have two questions. Sorry, do you have another question? No. Um, one is, um, I'm very interested in knowing how AI can be applied in the finance space. And where do you think is the low meaning fruit that we can apply AI in accounting, finance, f &A space? And two is, where did you get your Chinese name? Um, I just <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that. So, okay, I'll start yeah. with the second question first. <laughs> That's a shorter answer. So I spent a year living in Ningbo, China. So I was part of a, a kind of a oh, corporate yeah. service corps program. Yeah, so I was right. out there to actually do a leadership development program. And so when I was out there, you know, I met a lot of people I was going to be working with. And they told me that, oh, my name is Snow or my name is Jason. I'm like, no, what's what's your real name? Like, it'd be too hard to pronounce. They were surprised I was able to pronounce them fairly close. But I said that when I'm out there, like, I need a Chinese name. So they That's spent a, a couple one. hours asking me questions and trying to figure out the right name. So I'm, I'm very proud of that. That's a good one. It's a re resemble your last name very well. Very well. So um, in terms of like accounting, 
it is the slowest industry I've ever seen. <laughs> no offense to people, but they're just now starting to kind of get into it. They've seen the work like we did at H&R Block. And I'm seeing more and more of them now not looking at this, not just as tax preparation, but they're actually creating like almost onboarding tools. So to ingest client information, so you can just dump all your W-2s, your receipts to the AI. The AI will prompt questions via email or text message to the client to try and collect more information or follow up on documents that are actually missing. That's kind of where it's starting. I think long-term, I think a lot of people are thinking like, the AI will probably be able to absorb 30 to 50% of the tasks in terms of just accounting. So even like creating cash flow statements, balance sheets. So it'll never be 100%, but it'll be a good kind of start to the draft on that. And because AI understands all the Sarbanes-Oxley rules, they believe it'll actually improve compliance. And you're actually seeing some accounting firms, I can't name whom they are, are actually now using AI tools to actually implement audits. What what kind of tools are you uh, referring to? A lot of them were actually, they've built in-house for themselves because it's been such a cost savings. One of the, I'll call it the big six accounting firms uh, has built their own suite of AI tools and they were able to reduce their, their actual uh, review and auditing costs by almost 40%. Do they build it on top of like a, what, what what platform like a GPT or like which which they they built their own proprietary so that they use some APIs out there from like okay. uh, Microsoft and all that but they really built their own proprietary AI engine. Oh, interesting. And how about FPNA? What is Sorry, your uh, FPNA financial planning analysis? So. Aside from the due diligence tool I mentioned, um, particularly in like REITs and real estate investing, you have a lot of people actually now kind of doing this and not just looking at, they're looking at an asset and seeing how the asset could be used in several different ways. So when it comes to financial planning, like it's not like, okay, I got commercial property over here. Should I build a shopping center? Should I build a corporate park? through the AI, they're actually able to run a couple of million different scenario options under different conditions. And through that, the and some cognitive science models, I, I, want, I don't want to go too sciencey. They're actually able to figure out what they think the optimal use of their asset or their investment money actually is. Thank you. Can I just chime in on a couple of points uh, Dora raised? Uh, Neil, we uh, at Focus CFO are experimenting or piloting something within uh, Copilot, Microsoft product. As you as you know much better than most of us, it has all of those features which you mentioned kind of built in and we're, we're discovering more and more. So we being accountants, we wrote a song in one of the famous singers <laughs> uh, we could not really play it, but the wording was amazing. And I'm just gonna post that in the in the chat. And I never seen in my life, uh, 35 years being an accountant, a song written about debits and credit. And it was so profoundly good. I I, I was just amazed. <laughs> you should so, see if we, if we could write a haiku for you. That's right. It so it was, and it was funny. So another question Zora raised was uh, FPNA. Uh, we are kind of developing in-house tools, uh, just like Neil said. And what we're trying to do is take it to the level of uh, cash flow analysis and so on. Based on the past history, just projections, as simple as that, nothing too complicated. But uh, our project in Focus CFO is at the uh, early stages and we're all rookies. We have no prior knowledge, we're just experimenting. And they formed a forward committee of uh, five or six people who are just experimenting with this. And I, let me tell you, uh, it is a lot of fun. <laughs> well, that's great. I'm glad you guys are uh, actually experimenting a bit and uh, building your own tools. I mean, the one thing I got to emphasize, there are some great APIs. There, there are a few kind of solutions out there, but AI always requires some level of customization. You want to teach it the way you do finance, how your processes are. So you can never fully escape that. And, 
as a result, that's why you see a lot of people kind of either adapt some of these APIs or they wind up building their own internal tools. But there is a question I got here asking about the quote, garbage in, garbage out. How does AI reconcile that? It has accurate data. Who's certified to teach AI? So the AI doesn't know. There's no way for the AI to know whether the data is good or bad. It's just trusting the teachers, the subject matter experts. And that's why if you trust the technologists to do all this stuff, they don't understand how some of this works. Facebook got busted, I think, three months ago for redlining. So, you know, Facebook says we do our own advertising, this kind of stuff. We just take your money, tell us what you're looking for. And the problem is, is the HUD busted them for redlining. And they're like, well, it's the AI. They went to the developers and the developers, they asked the developers about it, and the developers like, what's redlining? You know, so that's that's part of the challenge. We, that's why you really need domain experts as part of all this. The data, getting good data and having a proper training plan is really critical. And the proper training plan is something a lot of organizations just overlook because they're, they're used to IT projects. I hand someone some requirements. It just doesn't work that way with AI. It, we call it the third generation of computing for good reason. It has whole new sets of capabilities. It works differently than like the second generation, which is basically executing a software program. So that's why often you need data scientists to help kind of at least with the shaping or structure, cleanliness of the data, but you still need the domain experts to do the teaching, to create the ground truth. So if your company is working on something that AI project and you don't see the subject matter experts involved, you're going to have problems. You're going to get that garbage in, garbage out issue. Just to share that experience as well, we had GIGO very much in play and uh, one extra zero throughout the whole cash flow like you would not believe. And it was a human error. Uh, obviously, the model we had did not pick it up and suddenly instead of having $6,000 in cash flow in one month, we had 60,000. So our projections were boom, totally out. So some sort of a vetting has to be done and some sort of rationale has to be thrown in. And it's just not as mechanical as a lot of people would like it to be. Uh, it's it's not, I know. And I think a lot of people have the expectation that we think the AI already knows how to do some of these things. It, it doesn't, right? Even if you're going to Microsoft Azure or going to open AI with ChatGPT, when you're paying for it, you're getting your own private instance. You don't get anything else other people have done. They don't get anything that, of your models or data that you've done. There's not like one chat GPT, there's literally 2 billion versions of chat GPT. So that's why a lot of this stuff is very important. Story from my own <laughs> history, early days of Watson after the Jeopardy challenge, we made the mistake of giving Watson the urban dictionary to read. And after that, it couldn't stop cursing. So now we're like, oh my God, we can't, we can't have this, right? Think about how hard it is to teach a child when to curse, not to curse. How do you do that with an AI system? We could not figure out a way. We literally had to revert back to an earlier version, earlier instance of Watson's where it hadn't read the Urban Dictionary. So we could not figure out a way to explain the appropriate times to use foul language, if there are ever any. <laughs> Any other questions? So, Rich, I have a question for you, um, if I may follow up your uh, experimenting with AI. Did you actually use the forecast made by Copilot? Um, so our company has formed, a, as I mentioned, a, a group to test it out until October when it's going to be launched across. So within Copilot, we have the license and all that to do all of that. Is that your question or? Yeah. Yes. So did you actually, like how close yes. is the forecast? So there is, a, there is a free version and there is a, yeah, so there is a, there is a paid version and there is a free version. We right. obviously have the paid version from Microsoft. How good it got, uh, it was pretty pretty decent, darn, darn close once we got it going and all that, once we had the right assumptions as Neil pointed out. And you use Copilot Excel? 
Is that what he used? Yes, in Excel, we, we're even building uh, now, we're getting to a point where we would like to build uh, pivot tables in Excel using Copilot. Okay. So Thank it you. depends on how you define it and how you ask it to do it. And uh, there is a financial version of Copilot, as we understand, in the works being prepared by MS. Um, Microsoft would love to get in, jump into that, considering Excel is their product and so on. It's in beta version at the moment. We don't have access to it. Only developers have it. And they're working on it. It's expected out in September. Again, don't quote me on it. I don't represent Microsoft at all. I don't like them at all. <laughs> <laughs> just so just I'm, for, just sorry, sorry, so everyone knows, Copile is based off of ChatGPT. So if you have issues okay. with ChatGPT, we'll have issues with Copilot. So I'm I'm going to put that little song and ditty in there. If somebody's interested, I never seen a song in my life on accounting, but this is amazing. Well, Tariq, I actually wrote five or six of them and sang them at a group outing uh, about 10, 15 years ago. And the, corp the company I worked in, to me and another guy, uh, we had like uh, – you know, different sessions. So we wrote one on uh, revenue recognition, one on cash flow. Uh, and what we did is we, it was, they were parody songs. So we, we, we kind of took the words from the songs and then in the music and, 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 you know, sang that in front of them. And I, they were, I forget, uh, there's one for uh, uh, under Sarbox instead of under the boardwalk. Um, so we had fun with that. It was just, you know, we two of us did it and sang it in front of uh, you know 40, 50 people, whatever it was. And, but well, yeah, Scott, that's a, yeah, a fun no. thing to do. But you know, it, it creative. And Scott, I hope it wasn't the billable time, but in any case, that's your decision. <laughs> you yeah. must be among those two percent of accountants who actually can write songs, because most accountants, including me, don't have that side of the brain at all. Yeah, it's it's actually pretty funny. I kind of have the fun side of the brain, but but I found numbers to be fun, which uh -huh. is how I, how I ended up in it because it was I think probably because I got recognition from a, a young age, so it became fun for me, and and that's how I ended up being in it. You're a dying breed, my friend. You're a dying breed. <laughs> I think I don't know about that. I think. Uh, it's probably more newer. I think the old breed was was. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't take it seriously. <laughs> well, uh, sorry, I put a link in the chat to a tool called Hey Jen. So it, it's if you want, you can take your song, Tariq, and you can either use an avatar or you can create a digital twin of yourself or something like that. Feed it the song, and Hey Jen will create a video so it'll actually sing the song for you. That will be fun because I did not know who Ethel Merman was. Honestly, that was before my time. So anyhow, um, I, later on, I did Google who Ethel was. It was just like my dad's time. And I figured I'm not going to have this thing. In the, I'd rather have Rolling Stones or somebody who's kind of a little bit more my gen <laughs> generation. But so that 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 link will do that for me. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if you, if you go there, you get like you can... You can play around with it. There's a free version. If you give it a script, it'll use an avatar. Or if you want to create a digital twin of somebody, you can do that too. But it'll sing the song for you. And you can it'll create a video you can share and reuse. That will be perfect. Uh, it will make up for my lack of attention to when they're doing this <laughs> training. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Wow. I just remembered our best one, Reckon It by the Desktop Light. <laughs> to meatloaf. Oh. <laughs> like I said, we had fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Scott, we should connect afterwards anyway. I'm I'm happy you're looking after the Charleston chapter and good to know. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? All right, Neil, thank you so much for uh, for presenting tonight. Um, it was very, uh, 
in, uh, I can't even think of the word I'm looking for here, but uh, you know, definitely brought some things that I didn't know and and, and uh, kind of got the brain going. And uh, I thought uh, uh, Zora had a great question there, and how can we use this going forward? But it's it, it's interesting. Uh, well, early on, you said we are the slowest. Uh, beyond uh, uh accounting just accounting <laughs> right well accounting right and uh and i and, and then you kind of the fact that there isn't a lot going on it's it's interesting but it, to some degree i think i don't know if we're we're if us and lawyers probably the, the the ones that are more uh you know Using our uh, sounds, it sounds a uh, uh, a little um, prideful, but you know, where are using our, our our brains the most? Maybe and you know, I don't know if that's part of it or, and they can't duplicate that part of the brain. I I honestly I I just think it's risk averseness and concern about liability. I have taught at law schools. My apologies to lawyers out there. The law schools teach you to be a very linear thinker is what I've learned. All right? There's use to that, but we live in an age where nonlinear thinking is an important skill set. Yeah. Neil, are they more linear than accountants? Oh, yeah, way more linear. <laughs> if it doesn't fit the sequence of boxes, then they're just like, uh... <laughs> Thank you. All right. By the way, Neil, do you? Sorry, one quick question, Neil. Do you have something similar for accountants as well? Like the presentation was very informative and it was based on lawyers' needs and so on. Do you have something similar for finance industry at all? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, this I've, I've done something for Fang before. I was just asked to, to focus on international arbitration, but I actually okay. have something that's that's more focused on. Uh, accounting, I have one that's in focused on finance in general and something actually on investment banking, private equity, venture capital. Perfect. Yeah. So next month you're speaking to uh, Fang chapter, please, if you can accommodate us. Yeah, I, I, I saw your note. I think uh, Charlotte helped me out. You're going to organize contact. that. Contact, yeah. So. Perfect. Yeah. Great talking to you guys. Thank you. Thank sure. you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we'll uh, hope to see you next month.